Um, let me first thank the dean for his very warm and very kind introduction. And of course, let me thank this university for inviting me and for being part of the Beijing Forum on Cognitive Linguistics, uh, which um, Professor Li from Beihang University has organized, giving us an opportunity to see, to visit, and to interact with many of the universities in Beijing. So I'm very honored, very pleased to be here. And I will pursue the lectures that we've already started now for three or four days. Um, some of you have attended some of these lectures. And for them, of course, what I will say today will be in the continuity of what I've been talking about. Uh, others, of course, will join us for the first time. And for them, I would like to quickly not recapitulate everything we did before, because uh, we actually covered a, um, a variety of topics. But I would like to um, bring back for a few minutes the, some examples that we had in previous lectures that are actually relevant to grammar, today's topic, and that are relevant to cognitive linguistics in general. What are the aims? What are the goals of cognitive linguistics? Uh, how is it part of cognitive science? Uh, how, in what ways that does it differ from other kinds of linguistics, for example? And it, what, in what ways does it um, pursue goals that go beyond the study of language and that include the study of cognition in general? So um, I started my first lecture on Friday with this very same <laughs> little picture. The important thing here is that a lot goes on in, in our heads, that is, in our brains, in our mind brains. And most of it we are not conscious about, whether it's vision, where we see something, but the brain is doing an immense amount of computational work in order to give us, ultimately, the sensation of the image, or whether it's language, where hidden behind the simple words of everyday language, that we find simple, that everybody around us can do. In fact, as humans, and part of the human species different, therefore, from other species on Earth, uh, we have, behind the simple words, we have vast conceptual networks that operate completely unconsciously through the activation of powerful neural circuits. Now, it is one of the essential aspects of cognitive linguistics that it is interested not only in the surface organization of language as we consciously perceive it, but it's also deeply interested in the hidden so-called backstage cognition that goes on unconsciously when we use language and, in fact, much more generally when we interact humanly in all kinds of activities that go beyond language itself and don't always require language. So the basic uh, fundamental background for the Beijing lectures is what you see on this slide. Number one, language is only the tip of the iceberg of meaning construction. It does not correspond directly to meaning. Meaning is much richer than the few words that we see in a sentence. Number two, meaning construction does not operate just in the realm of language and talk. Meaning construction operates in all kinds of areas of human activity, such as mathematics, art, religion, technology, poetry. Number three, the conceptual mapping that are studied by cognitive linguists are the same for all these very superficially different areas of human thought. So that's, if you like, a sort of key point, a, a very fascinating point. We use the same cognitive operations in order to do things that look to us humans that seem extremely different from each other. 
But below the surface of the difference of these activities, you have some fundamental cognitive operations that function over and over again. Therefore, linguistics sheds light on human thinking because language is a window into this backstage cognition. But conversely, the study of meaning construction in other areas will shed light on linguistics because it will reveal aspects of these cognitive operations that are sometimes hard to see by studying only language. Okay? So that's the background uh, that we operate with and that sort of guides, if you like, the, um, the work. Um, I indicated two websites, one uh, for uh, the, the website Mental Space Net. I don't know if everybody can see this pale purple here on the screen. Uh, the website is mentalspace.net, and it will give you access to the blending website, but also to the Beijing Forum website, where you have a number of readings related to the talks that I'm giving, uh, readings from many, many different researchers. Um, I also pointed out in my initial lecture, and so I repeat it here very quickly for those who join us today, that um, there are many, many, many books and special issues of journals that have been published on the specific topic of conceptual blending, which is sort of at the heart of uh, the lectures that I've been giving and that I will continue to give. And these books and special issues address a number of very different areas. The areas can be language, but they can be also social science, uh, design, artificial intelligence, music, art, uh, sign language, and so on. Again, if you look at the websites I indicated, you will find uh, not only these books, but also a great number of publications, which, may, which might overlap with some of your own interests in one or the other of these areas. The, the scientific point of you know, mentioning uh, this work is again to emphasize that the cognitive operations that we discovered initially through linguistic work turn out to be of use in other domains and give rise to work that is independent of linguistics, but that is actually uh, supported by the same kinds of scientific theories. OK, now, this morning at Beihang University, we um, addressed a very important topic of cognitive linguistics. We addressed metaphor, and one of the things that I tried to show in this morning's lectures was that metaphor was not a simple source-to-target operation, but rather involved the construction of rather complex and elaborate networks of integration. This afternoon, we're shifting from metaphor to grammar itself. And grammar, of course, is at the heart of what every linguist does, and in fact, it's in the heart of every linguist, right? Linguists, linguists love grammar. They are the, the only ones in the world who love grammar. Most people in the, in the uh, uh, rest of the world, the non-linguistic world, they think grammar is <clears throat> difficult and sometimes unpleasant. But as we linguists know, grammar is fascinating. So today, um, again, we'll focus on grammar. And a quick reminder from the previous lectures of some of, the, some of the things that we saw, that we studied, where grammar is actually involved, where grammar interacts with the meaning construction operations. Now, it's not surprising that grammar would interact because, in fact, language is what prompts the construction of elaborate mappings in our minds. So grammar is actually a, a sort of magnificent, very economical system that with few words can trigger vast meaning networks in because we have the brains 
equipped to do it. Our brains contain both background information that we've learned through, throughout our whole lives and that is structured in a special human-like way with frames, ICMs, idealized cognitive models, uh, connections between them, and many, many other things. So one of the things we started with in the previous lectures was mental spaces. And uh, one of the interactions of setting up mental spaces and grammar is language, like what you see here on the screen. And that for those of you who have the, uh, the book of handouts, you can find all this in the first lecture of, uh, of the handouts. And the very simple observation here is that a small text, like the one on the screen or in your handouts, will trigger a construction of connected mental spaces. So I won't go over the analysis, but this is basic mental space theory. Grammar helps to build up connected mental spaces. We saw another example that had to do with the same kind of thing, but with the organization of tense in language. And so we had a very small paragraph here with different tenses, is, has lived, lived, would move, would, and so on. And again, in the analysis that was presented and that you can read in the readings if you were not at the, at the lecture in question, what we saw was that the grammar in that case, with its tenses and sentence organization, triggered the construction again of several mental spaces that were related by time, on the one hand, this one, 1990, was uh, before the base space, and 1991 was after the base space. And um, there was also an interesting shift of, of viewpoint and focus from space to space. So this is a reminder for those who were at the lecture and an invitation to the others you know, to look in that direction for aspects of grammar that I will not have time to cover today. Um, in, the, in the example we just saw, an interesting corollary is that uh, the path that is built between the mental spaces, like here, past and future and uh, past again, past perfect, um, is mirrored by a grammatical sequence so that you have uh, the past in a semantic sense, connection between two spaces. In English, is actualized, is realized with the simple past and the future with the auxiliary will in English. And when you combine this, you get past plus will, and past plus will gives you move, would, which explains why we have the form would move in uh, the little paragraph that we, that we saw. More generally, in the mental space section, we saw that uh, tenses using the present, the past, or the past perfect uh, actually could be used not for time. All these sentences happen at the same time, the present. But the difference in tense is used to express so-called epistemic distance. That is, how, to what extent you think this is the case or not the case or maybe the case. Okay? And so, again, grammar here plays a big role in setting up these mental spaces in such a way that we have a different epistemic stance towards them, meaning that we have a different um, um, assumption about whether something happened or not. In here, if you have AAA, maybe you have it, maybe you don't. In here, if you had AAA right now, you're sort of suggesting that you probably don't have AAA, but maybe you do. And here, with the past perfect, if you had had AAA right now, you're actually, the grammar is allowing you to express a counterfactual. Namely, you're saying you don't have AAA, but you're setting up the counterfactual mental space in which you do have AAA. Okay? Okay. Um, in, the, uh, in one of the following lectures, this weekend, 
we studied phenomena of causal compression. And one example that we used was this sentence here. Martina is three points away from the airport. And the sentence was used in a case where Martina was a tennis player and she was about to lose the match. She was very close to losing the tennis match. And as a result, the person on the radio, who was the sportscaster who was uh, reporting the match, used this expression, Martina is three points away from the airport, to say she's three points away, metaphorically, from, being, from losing the match. But if she loses the match, then by the tennis ICM, by the idealized cognitive model of tennis that we know in this case, if we're tennis fans, then we know that if she loses, she'll be eliminated. If she's eliminated, she is out of the tournament. Typically, she will then go home. If she goes home, then one possibility is she goes to the airport and she takes a plane. So that in the final sentence, you have three points and you have the airport. You have very little explicit grammar, very little explicit words. The words are not telling you uh, about all this, but you're reconstructing this instantly in your mind. The literal reading of this sentence would actually make no sense. Three points away from the airport, airport's distance is not measured in points. It's measured in feet or in uh, miles or in inches and so on. So this is an example, and we saw many in that lecture, where the language is minimal, but where the reconstruction that needs to be done in order to actually understand the sentence, to reconstruct the full meaning, the reconstruction is actually very elaborate. So that's one of the mysteries of language. How can very sparse grammar produce very rich meaning constructions? Importantly, the mental leaps that we have to do are not always coded in the linguistic signal. In fact, in most cases, they're not coded. The linguistic signal just gives us, puts us on the right track. OK, we also um, devoted a um, large amount of time to studying the operation of conceptual integration, also called blending. And I pointed out that in order to do an integration, you had to, on the one hand, match inputs together, partially. You had to find a partial mapping between the inputs that depended on what they had in common, which was the generic space. And then you could build new blended spaces through conceptual integration. And in the blended space would appear emergent meaning through composition, completion, elaboration. Okay? So this is a fundamental, um, um, if you like, theoretical architecture that we have, conceptual integration. And in today's lecture, of course, I'm going to be applying this to problems of grammatical construction. Let me quickly, for those, again, who are joining us for the first time, let me give you a quick example of uh, conceptual integration. This, uh, this example is uh, a counterfactual, again. Counterfactual means it's talking about something that did not happen. In fact, here it's talking about something that is impossible. And the context for this particular counterfactual is, um, ah, ooh, is a case where uh, a teenage boy murdered his grandparents. And he was on trial. And he had been found guilty of murdering the grandparents. And now the judge was about to sentence the boy to say whether he would go to prison for five years, 10 years, forever, or worse. And his father, in this example, his father, this is, of course, attested data. This is real data. And the father is pleading with the judge and saying, please have mercy on my son. 
In fact, says the father, if the grandparents were still alive, if they, the grandparents, were still alive, they would also plead for mercy for their grandson. So in terms of conceptual blending, what is happening is we have one input where the grandparents, G here, are dead, and the son, S, has murdered the grandparents. And we have another input that is, of course, counterfactual, an input that is not the case, where the grandparents are alive, and they love the grandson. They love the grandson. Why? Because they've always loved the grandson. And we then build the blended space in which, paradoxically, the grandparents are alive, but they've been murdered. And they love the grandson, and they're pleading for mercy for the grandson. And the power of this particular blended space is that since the grandparents are the victims, if they plead for mercy, their opinion has, as victims has maximum importance and will maybe sway the judge. So even though literally this is an impossible situation, they can't both be alive and be murdered. But in the blend, it becomes a powerful rhetorical way of addressing the judge. Well, this is one of many, many very diverse examples. And I just wanted to bring it back for, um, to sort of refresh your memories for some and give a glimmer to others of what this blending could be about. So let's now um, start the new material in today's lecture, starting with grammatical constructions. Grammatical constructions are, have uh, syntax, they have syntactic organization, and they have meaning components. That's what a grammatical construction is. And let us start with a very simple um, grammatical construction. <laughs> is that the one I want? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll start with NP, NP, um, again, as a transition with the previous lectures because these examples were actually brought up in um, a couple of uh, days ago. And so here's an NPNP construction, noun phrase followed by noun phrase. And here are some examples. Caffeine headache. It's also a noun-noun construction, notice. There are two noun phrases, which each one in, the, in this case is a noun. And we have a nicotine fit, a money problem, and so on. And um, what was interesting about these examples is that they are the result of a blend creating, making, something out of nothing. Why? Because the money problem is not a problem because you have money. It's a problem of not having money. And the caffeine headache is produced, in this case, by not having your coffee in the morning. And that gives you a headache. So we showed in the other lecture that um, the, the way that this, the way that the missing things became things that we can talk about, like uh, you know, uh, a food emergency, meaning emergency because, in fact, there is no food, we showed that that was done through one of these blends. And it leads, then, to the grammatical construction, noun, noun, money problem, problem because no money. Uh, we also evoked a grammatical construction, I boiled the pan dry, where, again, there is very massive causal compression because the sentence by itself just tells you that you boiled something. And then it says, I boiled the pan. But you didn't boil the pan. You boiled water inside the pan. And then maybe, you know, you went for a walk. When you came back, there was nothing left in the pan because all the water evaporated and so the pan was dry. Well, on the screen here, you've got a long list of all the things that need to happen in order for you know, this to be the case, in order for the, to boil the pan dry. But you don't say them. You use the very economical, compressed grammatical construction, which in this case is noun phrase, verb, noun phrase, adjective. 
And that compressed grammatical construction allows you to reconstruct in a particular context to reconstruct a long chain of events which are not given to you explicitly. Okay, let's look at another simple construction, adjective noun. Well, when you're told about adjective noun, you think of red ball, and you say, well, the adjective just indicates a property of the noun. So the ball is something, and red is a property of that thing. The ball happens to be red. But in fact, you have many other now, uh, adjective noun combinations that are massive compressions and not just the property plus the thing. So here's an example, and there are many examples like that. The example is in English when you say that something is a guilty pleasure. So typically, a guilty pleasure is something that gives you gives you pleasure, but also makes you feel guilty. For example, you eat too much chocolate. Okay. Well, you know that you shouldn't eat chocolate, so it makes you feel guilty, but it gives you a lot of pleasure. Guilty pleasure is, is typically applied to small things, not to big crimes. Okay. So it's something like chocolate. And as you can see, when you say, this is a guilty pleasure, and you're referring to eating the chocolate, pleasure is not directly a description of the thing, of the chocolate, or eating chocolate. It is, in fact, an effect. So there's a cause-effect. Remember, causal compression. So there's a cause-effect link. You eat chocolate, and the effect is pleasure. They're different. But now, you compress. And you call eating chocolate, you call it pleasure. You call it a pleasure. Again, this falls under the, the sort of very general umbrella of metonymy, but it is, in this case, a causal compression. And so you can say that's a pleasure. You know, just like when you say, uh, you know, the, um, your introduction, professor, was a pleasure, I don't mean that your introduction is the same as pleasure, I mean that it triggers pleasure in me listening to the introduction. In the same way, guilty, now that we have pleasure, guilty is not a property of the pleasure. It's not the, the pleasure that is guilty of something. It's the person eating the chocolate that feels guilty. So again, you have a cause-effect compression. The chocolate is causing pleasure, but the chocolate and the pleasure together are causing guilt. You, are, you feel guilty because chocolate is you know, not recommended in your diet or you're eating too much or whatever. So you see that this very simple grammatical construction is actually used to evoke a very complex meaning, not just property plus noun. Um, right here, and maybe in the handout, you've got a uh, long description. No, maybe not in the handout. You've got a long description of, again, this causal sequence that you reconstruct when you use the term uh, guilty pleasure. Now, here's another example with, a, again, a very apparently very simple grammatical construction. Simple in the sense that it's noun adjective. So we have dolphin safe tuna. Tuna is a fish. And when you buy fish in American supermarkets, I don't know if uh, it's the same thing in China, in American supermarkets, they tell you that the tuna is dolphin safe. What does that mean? Dolphin safe is, again, noun adjective. What it means is a very, again, a complex causal sequence that you have to unpack. And the causal sequence is this. In this particular case, of course, it's a culturally driven causal sequence, which is that this is tuna that was, that was fished in such a way that it did not harm the dolphins. The dolphins were not caught in the nets and killed. 
as a result of catching the tuna. In other words, the catching of the tuna was safe for the dolphins, meaning safe for the dolphins, meaning the dolphins were not hurt. Okay? Now, if you think about it, this is quite a complex meaning. The tuna itself is not safe. It's not the tuna you're trying to protect because the tuna is actually already caught and dead and you're eating it. Okay? So when you say safe tuna here, you're not talking about the tuna being safe. You're talking, in this case, about the dolphin being safe. safe. And you don't have a systematic correspondence between noun, adjective, and this very elaborate meaning. You have to unpack the compression. And again, you unpack it by looking for the conceptual blends that will fit this particular situation. Now, notice here's a very similar expression grammatically, a child safe beach. Okay? Well, this is a little bit like the tuna because now, just as the dolphin is safe here, the child is safe in this case. You're, ta you're talking about a beach where it is safe to take children, meaning if you take the children there, they will not be hurt, they will not be harmed. For example, they won't fall on the rocks or they won't be eaten up by sharks. Okay? Child safe. But here's an expression that is exactly the same structure as child safe. A shark safe beach. You can say a shark safe beach. But in that case, you have to reconstruct a different causal sequence. It doesn't mean a beach that is safe where the sharks are happy and the sharks feel safe. It means a beach where children are safe from sharks or people in general are safe. So the lesson from this, there is a double lesson. The construction is very simple in syntactic terms. But there is no systematic recipe. You cannot use the grammar here directly to say, ah, that's the meaning, because depending on whether you put in child or shark or dolphin, you will get very different frames reconstructed. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, the meaning that you reconstruct is actually much more elaborate than the two words that you're given, or the three words in this case. You're given three words, shark, safe, and beach. Well, shark, safe, and beach could evoke many, many, many things. But you reconstruct a particular sequence. It's not ambiguous, a particular causal sequence. Namely, you can go to the beach, and there will not be any sharks, and uh, you won't be a victim of the sharks. Different from the other two. Because dolphin safe tuna does not mean, for example, that uh, the tuna can eat dolphin or something like that without getting sick in their stomach. Okay? So there are many possibilities that you could have if you just jumble the words, but in fact you don't have them. Okay, let us now jump to more um, elaborate grammatical construction. And I'm going to take two examples, one from English, the caused motion example that's been studied a lot in grammar. And then I will evoke quickly um, similar constructions, but different in French and Hebrew. So the, the guiding, the guiding um, theoretical ideas here are that grammatical constructions are themselves integration networks that you integrate, you blend the syntactic form with a kind of minimal meaning, you blend that with a much more elaborate meaning, and as a result, you get a new grammatical construction with an emergent meaning, emergent structure, again, in the sense that we uh, studied emergent structure yesterday in some of the previous lectures. So, the the caused motion construction in English has this appearance. It has a noun phrase, a verb, a noun phrase, and a prepositional phrase. And you have examples of that with verbs like throw. Jack threw the ball into the yard. So the verb throw is a verb that expresses simultaneously that the 
subject, Jack, is doing some kind of motion, that he is holding the ball, and that as, the result, as a result of the motion, the ball will move, will go to some other location, in this case, the yard. So with simple verbs like throw, the grammatical structure NP, VNP, PP corresponds to NP does something, and as a result of the action of NP, this NP, the second one, will move and will go to the prepositional phrase location in the yard. Okay, but we find in English very similar sentences, except that the verb they have, instead of being a verb of motion and action like throw, it's a verb that in itself does not imply that. So here's uh, example number one. Phil sneezed the napkin off the table. Now we have a verb sneeze. Usually this is a verb that is intransitive. It means, you know, choo, okay, you sneeze. And that's all. It's an intransitive verb. It has a subject, and the subject does something. But in that sentence, Phil sneezed the napkin off the table, it suddenly be seems to become a transitive verb with action on the napkin. And of course, what it means is Phil did something, sneezed, and as a result, something happened to the napkin. The napkin moved, and it was blown off the table. Right? Now. Here's a second example. The sergeant ordered the tanks into the compound. The verb order is not a verb of motion. It's a, it's a verb of social interaction. You give orders to subordinates or something. So it's different from the verb throw. Yet in this case, the consequence of the order of the sergeant is the motion of the tanks. So the structure, again, is exactly like the structure with throw, except we don't have the same kind of verb. And finally, in this example, with Junior sped the Christmas car around the tree, this is in the context where uh, Junior, the little boy, he just got a present for Christmas, and it's a you know, remote control car that you can control with a remote control. And, you, and he makes the car turn around the Christmas tree. But he himself, Junior, is not moving. He's sitting down. And as a result of his actions, the car moves around the Christmas tree. So in all those cases, you have the same grammatical structure as with throw the ball into the yard, but you have big differences. In this case, Phil is, is doing some action. In this case, the sergeant is interacting with someone, ordering, but in fact, he's not interacting with the tanks, but with people in the tanks. And there is caused motion. And finally, here, there is speeding. Speeding is a verb of motion, but it's not junior. It's not the subject who is speeding. It is the object that's speeding. It's the car that's going fast around the Christmas tree. Okay? And junior is not moving. So how, is this, how does this happen in English? And again, English has this con construction, but other, language, other similar languages, like French, for example, do not have this construction. So it's language specific. So let's now analyze the way that mental spaces are created and blended in order to allow this use of grammar. First, you have for simple verbs, for verbs like throw, okay, so imagine this is like the verb throw or the verb kick or the verb, you know, hit or something. That verb, throw, contains in itself an action that has a cause and that has a certain means and manner. In the simple construction, you throw the ball into the yard, 
you have this verb of cause and manner, there is an agent who does the action, and the action triggers a, mo a motion, motion of the object in some direction. Okay, very easy, right? Very straightforward. Throw the ball into the yard, kick the ball over the fence, and so on. Now, what languages do, and not just for this construction, but in general, is they take their simple <coughs> constructions, the transitive, the caused motion, the intransitive, and they map it on to a more complex semantic situation. Here, the second input, the one that's going to be the second input to our blending, is a semantic organization. Somebody acts, an agent here acts, that action of the agent causes something else, and something else is an object moves in some direction. Okay? That is the larger structure. And then the blending is going to consist, as in this sentence, it's going to consist in taking the simple input, the one with the direct grammatical construction, throw the ball into the yard, and map it on to the more complex in semantic input, the one that says there's an action, there is causation, and there is motion separately. Now, notice that when we have these two inputs, and the goal is to do an integration, the goal is to do a conceptual blend, we're going to have to find a mapping that connects the two inputs. And the two inputs are not isomorphic. They're not the same. In fact, this one is richer than that one. So there are going to be more than one possibility for effecting the blend. So one possibility, you have a single verb here, and you have three kinds of verbal semantic um, things happening in the, other, in the other input. So in theory, this could be mapped either to this one, or to that one, or to that one. You have a choice now in mapping. And therefore, you have several possible blends, depending on what kind of mapping you actually choose. So, take the case here. Gogol sne sneezed the napkin off the table. Well, in the semantic input, you have Gogol, the agent, doing something, sneezing. Ah, choo. Okay. And then that is causing the napkin moves off the table. Right? Now, in blending, we can take the verb element over here, and we can map it onto the action of the agent, which is sneezing in this case. Okay? So if we do that, if we map V onto sneeze, and then we project into the blended space, the other ones we will map, the other ones will be straightforward. The direction here, prepositional phrase, will map onto direction in the other input. The object here will map onto the object here and the agent will map onto the agent. So in the blend, we end up getting the same agent, Gogol, or we end up getting the same object, the napkin, and the same direction, the prepositional phrase off the table. But the verbal element that comes in comes in from this, acting. And so we get sneeze. So we get, in English, we get a syntactic structure that is exactly the same as in the simple case, but it has a more complex causal sequence. And the verb sneeze now occupies the position that would normally be the position of a verb like throw or kick. So we hear, uh, you know, Gogol uh, sneeze the napkin off the table. It's almost as if sneeze had become a verb of caused motion itself. But of course, it's not. This is the construction that does that. Now, look at the uh, next example 
the one with Junior speeds the car around the Christmas tree. Well, we have the very same, very same blending as a possibility. But this time, the, what we're focusing on the motion of the object. It's the car that's speeding around the tree. Notice the sentence, the sentence that says, Junior speeds the car around the tree, does not in itself, the language in the sentence does not tell us anything about what kind of action Junior was actually doing. We understand the, the uh, sentence in context because we know, oh, this is a, a remote control car, so the action of Junior must have been, you know, touching the remote control. And the cause is not, the causal link is not specified explicitly in the sentence because, again, we happen to know that using the remote control has some effect on the motion of the car, but this is not in the language of the sentence. So the sentence actually only uses the motion of the object. And the blend that we uh, are constructing is projecting the, the uh, verb of caused motion from here, V, projecting to this position, move. So this is speed. The car speeds around the tree. And speed can then be projected into the verbal position of the blend. So I hope this is not getting a little too technical. It's easy in conception. You have a choice. In the previous example, it's the sneezing that got projected. In this example, it's the motion, speed, the motion of the car. And in the next example, the one with the, uh, the, one with the sergeant ordering, or in the, I have another sentence, letting the tank into the compound, same thing. He lets the tank or he orders the tank into the compound. Um, what is happening here is the very same integration uh, template very same integration schema, this time is projecting the cause into the blend. It's because the sergeant gives an order or lets, let is a, a causal verb in the sense of um, tell me, if you went to tell me's lecture, it's a verb that, a uh, force dynamic verb that removes uh, an opposing force. So a verb like let is only talking about the, the causal aspect. It's not talking about, if you say, he let the tanks into, compound, into the compound, you don't know what he did. Okay? How did he let them in? Did he let them in by uh, you know, raising the, um, the, um, the barrier in front of the tank? Did he let them in by giving the order, go into the compound? Did he let them in by opening the door? The sentence doesn't tell us that. It just says that there was some action, we don't know what, of the, of the uh, sergeant that caused the motion of the tanks into the compound. And it doesn't tell us how the tanks moved. It doesn't tell us if the tanks moved by, you know, uh, um, for example, by themselves, that they were moving on their caterpillar-like uh, wheels, or if they were sitting on a truck and the truck was moving the tanks into the compound. Again, the sentence doesn't tell us that. So the lesson from these kinds of examples, the lesson is that we can augment the range of a simple construction, throwing the ball into the yard, where throw, has, throw contains the action, the cause, and the motion. We can enrich that with other verbs that will be projected either from, one, from acting, from causing, or from moving by, again, exploiting the possibilities of blending. If you look in some detail at English sentences with these uh, verbs, you'll find some pretty interesting, again, a pretty interesting range of facts. So, for example, you have the audience laughed the poor guy off the stage. So if you start laughing at me, and saying what Fauconnier is saying, really ridiculous, and then uh, you know, I will be, I will be uh, <coughs> upset, worried, and I will have to leave the room or something. Okay. 
So this would be to laugh somebody off the stage. You use the verb laugh, which again is an intransitive verb, but you project it in the way that we, um, that we saw before, namely uh, you take the action of the audience, here's the audience laughing, and that causes, that causes the performer to, be, to go out of the room he, or off the stage. They laughed him off the stage. In the same way, if you say Andy rolled the drum into the warehouse, Andy is doing something, but he's not rolling himself. It's the drum that is rolling, okay? And it's going into the warehouse. It's like the junior example. Um, but now, look at the, he muscled the boxes over the fence. This time, the verb indicates that his actions needed muscle somehow in order to get the to cause the boxes to go over the fence so you can have verbs like muscle coming in now here's a very interesting one hunk choked the life out of him so hunk is a is a fighter and he's fighting somebody else and in fact killing the poor person and you can say that in english you can say that in the form hunk choked the life out of this poor guy, of him. Now, you cannot choke life. So if you just look at this part, hung, choked the life, you can see that choke is a transitive verb, but it does not take an object like uh, the life. What's happening here is a combination of the blending with a metaphor. The metaphor is a metaphor that when we are alive, we have life inside us. We are full of life. But when we die, the life goes out of us. Okay? That's the metaphor. So here, in this case, if you look at the, uh, again, if you look at the blending structure, you have hunk is doing something, which is choking. He's doing some choking. And this is causing, what is it causing? It's causing, metaphorically, it's causing the life to go out of the person. Okay? So even though hunk is really choking the person, the sentence itself does not, is not organized in that way. It's organized in such a way that what you've got is the life goes out of him, and so in the blended space, the life is projected to the object position of the sentence. In a way then that's, you know, he threw the ball out of the yard, he choked the life out of, out of Bill. When you throw the, the ball out of the yard, you throw the ball. But when you choke the life out of Bill, you don't choke the life. The reason you get the actual uh, complex sentence is because you've been able to do the grammatical blending. So all these examples are meant to show you the interaction of grammatical constructions with blending and the fact that the grammatical constructions themselves are fundamentally compressions. They're ways of compressing a, um, an elaborate causal sequence like he choked somebody and as a result of choking uh, the person died, and therefore the person died. That means that the life went out of that person. Long causal sequence, compressed into choke the life out of him because of the blending that we just saw. Here are a few more examples. He trotted the stroller around the park. A stroller is where you carry uh, little babies and children, right? Now, the, tr the stroller is not trotting. You, probably you are trotting, trotting in pushing the stroller. But if you trot the, the horse into the stable, it's probably the horse that's trotting. Maybe you're holding the horse with the leash, or maybe you're sitting on the horse, and the horse is trotting. Again, this is because in the blend, you have a choice. So if you, if you are trotting, and the stroller moves around the park, okay. The projection is coming from here. Your action trotting 
is being projected into the verbal position. But if it's the horse that's trotting, then trot is projected from the motion position. In other words, a sentence that looks the same, like um, the trainer trotted the horse into the stable, or uh, the, the, the um, uh, father trotted the stroller around the park, can actually have very different meanings. One, the father is trotting. The other one, it's the horse that's trotting. And the possibility is simply available because the blend is not fully determined. There are several ways to do the blending of the grammatical construction. So English is exploiting a very rich construction in order uh, uh, to use a very economical grammatical form. I'll skip some of these later examples. They have the same flavor. You can look at them in the handout. And um, also mention that you can do the same kind of analysis, the one I did here. You can do it for other grammatical constructions in English, like the resultative construction that we talked about before. I boiled the pan dry. Again, you can do it as a uh, blending of simple grammar over here and complex causal sequences over here. Why Now, this is useful uh, for understanding grammar, but it has a, more, a sort of wider implication, which is that, in that one of the powers of language is to be able to take long, diffuse, complex sequences and compress them maximally. Now, we've seen that many times in the previous lecture. We saw that for metaphor. We saw that for causal compressions in general, writing uh, with Hitler, and so on. And now we see it for grammar. Now, grammar, of course, these grammatical constructions, they are conventional. They are entrenched. You learn them as a child, and you transmit them to the next generation. And so they have a lot of stability, and they are shared by the community, the linguistic community. And unconsciously, we know how to do these possible blends so we can understand this big range of sentences. There is another interesting consequence for linguists, which is that because it's blending that's going on behind the scene, there is an element of uncertainty. And when the uh, constructions are transmitted to children, to another generation, there can be slight mutations in the blends so that they seem the superficial result is hardly noticeable, but in fact the blend has changed. And I would suggest, and in fact this has been defended by uh, linguists like uh, Michael Israel and others, which is that historical change, diachronic change in language, is the result of very slight mutations in the grammatical blends. But after a certain amount of cultural time, you end up, of course, with a form of the language that, ha that looks very different from the one you started out with. So that's, um, again, something that's pretty fundamental to language. Now, on the handout, you'll find some examples from French. And this is a long, detailed analysis of French, which I'm not going to do here. But I will just point to it, evoke it. It has some connection with the, uh, the case that we just saw in English, but it's not exactly the caused motion. It's the so-called clause, uh, clause union construction, or causative construction. And it, again, if you look on page 56 of the handout, page 6 of the handout for today, if you only have today's lecture, then um, you have the French on the handout. And here, I've made a sort of un a, a, a translation, a literal word-for-word -word translation in English. And the, the point that I want to bring out is that French uses the verb faire, which is sort of like make or do, in order to build things like Pierre makes eat Paul, meaning Pierre does something that has the effect of Paul eating, or Pierre sends the package, Pierre makes send the package. Pierre fait envoyer le paquet in French. And over here, Pierre makes eat the soup to Paul. Okay. This 
construction, this double verb construction, is actually very, very complex. People have written big books about it because it has many funny grammatical features. But if you look at it in terms of conceptual blending, there, is, there turns out to be an easy and elegant solution to the grammatical mysteries. What French is doing with this construction is actually using the same basic structure, the transitive structure, like Pierre sends the package, or the, uh, <coughs> the structure here, which is the, um, what did I call it in the handout, the transfer, the transfer uh, structure, transfer structure, give something to somebody, give the soup to Paul. And it's taking a, a more complex causal sequence and it is blending it with the simple syntactic structure, the transitive or the intransitive for that matter, and here the transfer structure. So the way that looks, the way the, the, the blending looks, is illustrated on your handout on page 8. And I've given only one example, but in fact there are three different blends. Okay. And the three different blends take as their inputs the three basic, three basic structures of French. And then, just as in the English example, they take a more elaborate causal uh, sequence and they blend it with the simple grammatical construction. So here's the example with the transitive case. You have the transitive case, like uh, Mary feeds Paul, okay, causal agent, some event, and some object. That's the simple transitive construction. Mary hits Bill. And then on the other side, you have a more complex input. Somebody does something, a causal agent acts on the object, and as a result, there is an event that happens. This is the event agent who also happens to be the object of the action. So O and EA are the same. In the blend, you get a causal agent you get action of the causal agent is marked by the verb faire, which is make or do. And then you get the event itself marked by another verb. And then you get the object. Now, instead of doing what English did in the previous construction, compressing with the grammatical structure of the input, French has an emergent grammatical structure here with two verbs. So we find two verbs. And as a result, because there are two verbs in this emergent blended structure, there are several positions for clitic pronouns and um, other uh, prepositional pronouns, actually, that can go into these positions. And that's one of the things that gives rise to the complexity. Again, no time here to go into the detail. What's really interesting, I emphasize, is that in uh, understanding what's happening in French as using a blend to get the, simple, the simplest possible grammatical structure and understanding that there is not one single structure here but really three, although they look the same, then we can separate and unravel the grammatical differences. OK, um, a couple more examples. Going back to simplicity, the case where you have two nouns, noun, noun. Again, they can be noun phrases. So noun, noun. Here's an example, a land yacht. So you just put the two nouns next to each other. The yacht is a boat. It doesn't go on land. The land does not support yachts. What the two little words here trigger is the construction of a blend with two inputs, one with yachts, you know, boats, skippers, water, and so on, and the other one with cars, drivers, roads, and owners. And in the blended space, you project some of this and you project some of that. What you get is the idea of a car that's very big and that has you know, suspension like that that floats and that in some ways 
makes you think of a yacht because it's so big and so, and so uh, the suspension is such a floating kind of suspension. And it's also for a rich person, perhaps, the owner, um, and so on. Okay? So very simple example. Notice the two words that you use, land and yacht, in order to get the understanding, you have to use yacht in order to evoke the entire frame of boats and sailboats and skippers. And over here, you have to evoke the entire frame of roads and cars. And in the blend, you get a new, you get something novel, something creative, a new kind of car that is neither exactly a car nor exactly a boat. OK. Um, I'm going to stop pretty soon because um, time is running out. But I'd just like to, in, in, in connection with all the uh, cases of conceptual blending that we have looked at, I'd like to point out that there are systematic grammatical ways to build these blends. You don't have to use them. We gave many examples that did not use a specific grammatical marker that did not say, oh, th watch out, this is a blend. But language has such grammatical markers. And so if, for example, in English, is actually typically something that lets you explicitly trigger the building, the construction of a blend. And you can see that with some of these examples. You know, If I were you, I would resign. This is a blend of me and you. It's a complex integration, actually, of your situation, my beliefs, and my attitudes. And you get a novel, uh, a novel imaginative situation. I'm resi you're resigning, but you are me. Um, or this one. If cars, this, is a, this was a, a, an ad for Volvo, the car company Volvo. And it said, if, it's a very bad ad. Okay, so don't be shocked, but it's, again, real data. It said, if cars were men, you would want your daughter to marry this one. So what it's doing is, it's not supposing that cars and men are the same thing, exactly. It's creating a metaphorical correspondence between men and cars, and owning a car, and marrying a certain kind of, of man. Um, in the same way, this last example, if love is a journey, then you and I have run out of gas. The first part, if love is a journey, is setting up the metaphor, the metaphorical blend. And then once you've set it up, you can start to describe the blended space. And in the blended space, you and I, in love, are traveling, but the vehicle we travel in no longer has any gas, which, of course, means that our love story is finished. Okay? We can't move along anymore. So this is true of all these examples. And um, again, some of the examples that we discussed in other lectures, for those who were at the other lectures, they could be formulated by using the explicit grammatical form. They don't have to, but they could. So the debate with Kant, you may remember, we could express that explicitly with the if construction. And we could say, if Kant were alive, this is the, um, uh, this example with Kant is the example where uh, I'm presenting my ideas and comparing them to Kant's ideas. And in order to do that, I'm building a blend of a debate with Kant, where Kant is actually in the room with me and he's arguing with me. Okay? So this is a pretty routine blend. In order to present ideas, you bring people back from the dead, and you sit them in front of you, like Kant, and you start arguing. Well, you could do that with a, uh, an explicit marker of if. So if Kant were alive, he would say, and then blah, blah, blah. You invent Kant's opinion. In doing that, if Kant were alive, you're act what are you doing? you're actually setting up one of the inputs. You're taking the input in which Kant was alive and Kant was expressing opinion. And then you're blending it with the present situation. The second example, if Kant and I were debating this issue, he would say, you know, here's what he would say. This is, again, a grammatically marked construction of the debate blend. But this time, the if clause 
is explicitly describing the blend itself, the blend with the debate that I'm constructing. And finally, you can do it in using analogy with if I were Kant, I would answer. So I can say, here's what I have to say, uh, uh, you know, uh, the neural basis of the, of the mind is this or that. And then I can take a different role and say, if I were Kant, I would say this. But of course, that would be wrong. My idea is right and Kant is wrong. So I can sort of shift from one to the other. And these are different kinds of blends that I can build explicitly now with grammar in order to do the very same thing that we saw with the initial um, Kant debate blend. The same thing for many, many other ex examples here that we discussed, and I'll skip them. Um, very little word, very small grammatical words like if and of trigger very systematic mappings. Okay? So that's something else. Not just the complex grammatical constructions like uh, sneeze the napkin off the table, but also simple words. And so here you have a variety of sentences that are built with of, but they have different meaning structure. This is a metaphor. Vanity is the quicksand of reason. Makes you build a, a metaphorical blend with vanity and reason on one side and quicksand and travelers on the other. This is a case where it's a frame and the role fillers for that frame. Paul is the father of Sally. They have the same, as it turns out, they have the very same mapping structure that you find here. So of, as a grammatical word, is inviting you to construct blends of this kind. But the blends that you construct may turn out to be, in the, on the surface, may turn out to be a simplex blend like this one, which is just a frame filling. Or it may be a metaphorical blend like this one. Or it may be an analogy like uh, Einstein and Missoula here. OK, so I think that's, um, it gives you at least a little, a small idea of the ways in which grammar is powerful in order to give us a pre-built set of compressions that we can use in very, very different circumstances. Even though the grammar by itself is sparse, there's not much, not many words, the construction is simple, but we can apply the construction to something very different. And again, by causal decompression, we can reconstruct the missing causal sequence. That's the power, power of grammar through blending and compression. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop here. And, uh, And then um, if we have time for questions, I will gladly in, um, listen to your comments.